Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop and welcome back to my series on building this curvy serpentine chest of drawers. Last time we looked at the design and the lumber selection and we ended up making up our panels for the case. This time we're going to get into the case joinery. And before we get started, again I want to say a big thank you to Triton Tools for sponsoring this series and continuing to support this channel as they have over the last several years. As we go through each of these videos, we'll be taking a closer look at some of their products. We're going to get into routers, this time and next time, this time we're going to take a look at the three and a quarter horsepower TRA router. They'll be telling you about this guy later on, but for now, let's get uh, into making some uh, big dovetailed box thing. <laughs> nice snowy day outside today. Good day to be in the shop, tending on with the chest of drawers. So here are the panels from last time. And the first thing I'm going to do today is get these things uh, labeled and get them cut down to their final size so they're ready to start on the dovetail joinery. So continuing on with the theme of eliminating places where we can screw up <laughs> is uh, really well labeling these components. So at this point, these are just side panels. They have an outside face. They don't have a top, bottom, or front. So I want to take a few moments just to decide which is going to be the left side, which is going to be the right side, what's going to be up, and what's going to be down. So this is what we're going to be looking at for the layout, the right side with the front, and this will be the left side. The uh, biggest determining factor for this is going to be this knot back here. I don't want any of this showing on the front edge of the case. So with that one to the back, this becomes the layout, and this is going to work out pretty well too. I have a bit over an inch to trim off the width, so that will allow me to remove this section of sapwood here so I have a nice... Uh, heartwood face for the front of the cabinet. Now how you mark up your panels to lay these things out is going to be totally up to you. Most important thing is that you know your markup convention. Uh, that's really about it. So this is going to be the right side, so I'm going to give it an R. I like to indicate what the front edge is and which way is up. So that's all I need for now to go through the cutting process to get these cut down to their final size. Same thing over here left, top, and then front. So now it's very clear to me which way is the top side of the panel and what is the front edge of that panel. It makes it a lot easier when I'm over on the table side, getting these things cut down to their final size because there's no guesswork of which way things need to go. This one's gonna be the top. The only thing I need to determine here is what's gonna be up, what's gonna be down doesn't matter because this is not a visible panel. But for me, I'm going to go with, uh, let's go with this. So T for top. I know that's the front edge because it's, uh, well, it's got walnut on it. <laughs> for the top and bottom, I always label the, uh, the side you're going to see. So for the top, it's going to be the very top. For the bottom, it's actually going to be the inside face. Again, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you're consistent and you know <laughs> what you're doing, I guess. So I think I'm gonna do this edge here at the front, so I'll give this one a B, and then I'll put a little arrow there towards the front edge. So with that bit of layout taken care of, it should be a pretty simple manner to get these cut down to their final size. I'll take them over to the table saw and start by taking these two final width so for the sides, those are the most important ones. I'll just spend some time to make sure I get that front edge looking really nice without any sapwood on that one side. The other one shouldn't be too much of an issue. I'm not super worried about keeping the panel symmetrical, or in other words, having the two uh, boards be the same width and having that glue seam right in the middle. That's not as important to me as removing any defects and making the things that are actually visible and important, you know, actually look good. So in the case of this chest of drawers, the front edge of the sides is more important to me than the, uh, the actual faces or the sides of the case. Now one small change that I'm going to make to my overall initial plan is that the top and bottom are going to be cut back in width by the thickness of the backboards which I'll add on here. So they're going to be 5 eighths of an inch narrower than the sides or than they originally were supposed to be. That's going to allow me to have my backboards recessed and attached to the top and bottom and we'll add a rabbit to the, uh, the sides later on to receive those backboards. And then lastly, I'll go through and cut everything down to final length. Again, for the top and bottom, they are two slightly different lengths. Again, for 
the two different joinery methods. One's gonna be, what do we say, a quarter inch shorter than the other one. The top is gonna be a quarter inch shorter than the bottom for the uh, different style of dovetails. The case sides are pretty easy. That's gonna be 28 inches long and looks like I'm going to just barely sneak that out of the, uh, the shorter panel and have those knots and defects hidden later on in the project. So with all these panels cut to size, now I can start working on the dovetails. I'm going to start on the, uh, the through dovetails on the bottom of the case, since that's going to be, well, I'd say easier, but I mean, it's all kind of the same. The top and bottom of the uh, chest like this are going to be uh, tail boards. I'm going to cut these tails first. You'll see with the structure of the uh, chest like this, the whole structure is tying the two sides together. So all the horizontal pieces of the case are going to be tail boards holding the sides together so they cannot pull apart. You had a mechanical advantage of the dovetail keeping the sides from coming apart. Ugh. So top and bottom are tails and so are, of course, the dovetail dividers, which are going to the front. Now, one thing I like about cutting dovetails is it's, uh, it's, it's kind of fun and there's so many different ways of doing things. Uh, I have several different like techniques or styles that I'll do these things in depending on my mood. Today I'm going to do uh, bandsaw and table saw assisted hand cut-ish dovetails, I guess, but you know, depending on your mood or what you're trying to do or whatever, you can cut these things however you want. Doesn't really matter as long as they you know fit together nicely. The other great thing about this stage of things is that these are structural dovetails. They will never be seen. So this is a good time to practice or warm up or whatever if you're not feeling super confident about your dovetailing skills. So these are just, you know, arbitrarily laid out. It doesn't matter how they look. It doesn't matter what the spacing is. It doesn't matter at all, except apparently I haven't done this for so long. I'm forgetting half a, half a tails here and there. So I will probably, when I bring us with the saw, I'll probably open these up a little bit. Uh, I don't really need tiny little pins on this because you're not going to see it. So I'm, I'm not particularly worried about that. A wider pin is going to be easier to cut. And uh, at this point, since this is all just structural, what this actually ends up looking like doesn't really matter. So over at the bandsaw, I'm going to use my little taper jig guide thing and uh, make all these cuts. The nice thing about that too is that I can repeat the exact same spacing and layout on the other side just to help speed things along a little bit. So with our tailboard all cleaned up, next we start working on transferring the tail locations over onto the pin board here. So I'm going to get this uh, all jigged up and ready to go for that. So you can see how this is going to come together. I have a little bit of material up here in the front for cutting the serpentine pattern in there. That'll give me a little bit of extra leeway with that, and then I have the uh, back panel or the bottom panel set back 5 eighths of an inch, which is gonna allow the back panels to slide right in here and attach to the bottom. I have everything kind of lined up here along the edge, so now I can grab my marking knife and trace around all the tails. Now 
Now I will say this a little bit right here. If I was smart and actually paid attention to the layout, I would not have had a pin fall right in this knot because this is not going to be fun. And uh, it probably caused me a little bit of grief. I could have saved quite a bit of hassle by either eliminating this pin altogether or putting a pin over here or something like that and making a really wide tail. Something along those lines, some kind of layout where I don't have like a pin coming up through this knot. It's just going to be a pain in the butt. But hey, should make things interesting. For me at least. Maybe. <laughs> So now we have all the waste to remove between the pins and you could come in here with a coping saw, cope out the bulk of the waste and then come back and chop along the scribe line. I'm feeling incredibly lazy today so uh, I'm going to use some power tools. I'm going to go over to the bandsaw, just to, like hog out the majority of the waste from between the, uh, the pins and then we'll go over to the table saw, set the blade height to the scribe line and then just uh, well, we'll uh, sweep the board back and forth across the top of the blade and now remove all the waste from between the pins and leave us with a relatively flat area for the, uh, the base of all these pins. And we'll have a little bit of cleanup work to remove a little bit of material against the pins uh, from the little angled bit and probably just a little bit of cleanup work to get the bottom area there nice and flat. So after a little bit of power tool action, we'll have a little bit of light hand tool finesse work to do. And then, yeah, we'll go from there. a little tight. Let's just uh, take a quick look. All right, over here feels good. Middle feels kind of tight. Yeah, outside's good. So let's take a look at the middle. It looks like I'm catching on the side of this uh, this goofy one over here. This one is really hard to get cleaned up because it's all the grain direction is all goofy. I think just for the sake of moving on here, this is, this is kind of overkill anyway. I'm just going to get all this material out of the way. They went together. That's all that really matters for a structural joint like this, which is you know not going to be seen ever. But it's also a good warm up. You know that's passable. I would not want that for like the side of a blanket chest or something, but you know, that's pretty good for a, a quick and dirty-ish through dovetail for the side of a case. The, yeah, I guess it's the side of the bottom, bottom side of the case. There's a little bit better view of that. Nothing to write home about. There's a few gaps here and there, but eh. Not, it's not my worst work either. <laughs> okay, so we got uh, 
Ugh. One side. And oh, what's this? Oh, two sides. <laughs> exactly the same process to do this side. Just another through dovetail joint. So let me get this in here and then we can uh, work on getting the top dovetailed into the uh, case assembly. So now we have the top, which is gonna go, you know, on top. Haha. -ha. <laughs> so the process for this one is gonna start out very, very similar to the bottom. First thing is gonna be to cut the tails into the top. So to start the layout, the, uh, I guess the biggest difference here is that since these are gonna be half blinds, we know this panel is a quarter inch shorter than the bottom. We want to have the tail length be an eighth of an inch shorter. So I have a marking gauge here that's set to five eighths. The other one is set to the full thickness three quarter. So this will give me a uh, proper length once this goes inside of the, uh, the case size. So I'll scribe my five eighths line all the way around here. And then we'll go through the uh, Pretty much the same exact process to create this tailboard. I'm gonna randomly, ooh, ooh. I'll randomly lay out some tail pattern, and then from there we can get them cut out. Probably do the same exact thing. Head over to the bandsaw, cut out all the tails, and then uh, clean them up. Because. Uh, through dovetails and half blinds, at least up to that point, creating a tailboard, exactly the same. The difference comes in with half blinds when you get into the pins. Let's get these tails transferred to the sides. We got this nice, I don't know, holding alignment jig thing. I got a little ahead of myself. I need a scribe line. And before I forget, I got the uh, same setting from before. This is the thickness of the case parts, or three quarters of an inch. So half blinds, we got two different scribes. Okay, now we can get these aligned and transferred. So once again, we're sitting five eighths of an inch from the back and I have my tails just sitting just a little bit over the scribe line. That's going to give me a little bit of a tighter fit, uh, or at least it should. It'll give me a little more leeway later on. So I got that all in the right position. I can go around and just trace around all these tails, just like the, uh, the through dovetails. I'll go around and do the other side, so that's out of the way. So normally with the uh, half blind dovetails, you'll see me remove the bulk of the waste at the drill press with a Forstner bit. Uh, two little issues right now. Oh, there goes that square. Uh, we'll check it later. Uh, two issues with that right now. First off is this is kind of a big panel and it's kind of awkward to do that on the drill press. Second bigger issue is in the move I can't find my uh, chuck key for the drill press so I can't actually put anything in it right now. So we're going to use the router which is uh, also effective at removing some of this waste. 
when doing this, I like to have it oriented so we're cutting uh, with the end grain up. So you think about how the fibers are in here right now, like this, and the router comes in here, it's got to scoop those fibers out, and it's only cutting the fibers down here at the base. If you're coming in like this way, uh, say the router is coming like this, straight down through here, then you're actually cutting all the fibers. So this is a much more easy cut on the router. It's very easy to control and uh, all that. You'll see it actually pulling these big old fibers out of here. So that's kind of nice. So all I'm doing is just laying out my start and stop points and then I can use the router on the end grain and just kind of scoop out the majority of the waste. I have the bit depth set to be just a little bit above the actual baseline. That's going to give me a little bit of leeway in case you know, the router tipped or something like that. And I have a little bit of just really quick chopping work to finish up the rest of that uh, cut. Along the back, I'm just going to eyeball freehand that as close to that back line as possible. I'm not super worried about that either. That's going to be a pretty th quick thing to clean up and just come in with a chisel and remove the little bit of waste in the back there. So that's going to remove the vast majority of all the waste in here really quickly. And then all I have to do is a little bit of chisel work. So while I'm clearing out all that waste, let's talk a little bit about Triton's routers. In the video, I'm using the MOF, which I tend to use for freehand routing. And then the TRA is a larger, more powerful router. The TRA is a beast of a router and shares all the same award-winning features as the MOF. The TRA is great for heavy duty work spitting big bits or for applications where you need a greater plunge depth. I've had mine set up in the work center's router table module for five years now, and this thing is always ready to go. One of the features of the Triton routers is a built-in raise and lower mechanism, so you don't need a dedicated router lift for this router. The crank can be fed through the tabletop and engaged with the router, and you can crank that router up and down just like you could with a router lift. Now, another great feature here is if you keep cranking all the way up, you'll engage the spindle lock and you'll be in router bit changing mode so you'll be able to change that router bit from above the surface of the table with only one wrench. That lock feature is also nice on a bearing guided bit. If you want to change that bearing out, you can hold that bit in place while you change the bearing. So that is the TRA, and next time we'll take a look at the MOF. So now we have a little bit of cleanup left to do inside of here. I got you know, relatively close to that back wall with the router. So I think I'm going to start in back here. I'm not super worried about this being too delicate right now because it is a fairly straight grain area. I am going against the grain as I'm pulling, as I'm coming down with the chisel. So I'm just going to keep that in mind as I'm working. But if uh, I was really worried about it, like if there was a a bit of figure here or a knot or something, I can clamp uh, another board in front of here and that'll help support the uh, fibers as we are cleaning them up. But this back area should go pretty quickly. This one's a little bit uh, troublesome because it's not perfectly vertical grain. The grain's running kind of like down that way. So I should just finish this one over here so I kind of know what the, uh, the grain is trying to want to do over here. So normally I would just come in along the back here with a wide chisel and just give it a little chop down there. But uh, I know it's not going to be super effective on this one because I need to be chiseling kind of an, a weird angle sideways. So I'm just going to work back a little more here and then I'll start walking back along the line. What's happening is it's trying to pull my chisel into the uh, the keep area, and if I go too far, I'll blow out the front, which we uh, don't really want. This side is worse than this side. I think the grain behaves or starts behaving a little nicer as we get to the, uh, the end of the board over there, closer to you. Okay. So now I am right on the scribe line right here. So now all I'm going to do is just walk my way towards the end of the board. So now we can move on to the pin walls. So I'm just going to sever the fibers down here along the bottom, make my chisel really 
glide through here as I come across the grain. So I'm just being a pairing right back to the scribe line a little bit. And when I get kind of kind of close, I can go for the, uh, the actual final cut. So I have my scribe line right here, my vertical one, and then I have the one across the end grain that I'm going to follow. So I'll take my chisel and put it directly into the vertical scribe line. That's going to tell me my squareness angle. So I need to lock the chisel, chisel in this orientation, and then I can push forward and steer along this top scribe line. So I come right in here. And just work back towards that back corner. Might not get it all in one pass like that, which is fine. You can come back and you can press the chisel into the area that's the flattest in the back here. And now again, set your angle like this, and you can just kind of feed forward. Now there's just a little bit of junk there in the corner, so I'm just going to start working that back. Get some of the junk out of the bottom there. And then I'm going to come across the back a little bit. I can come across the side. Let's pop that bit of junk out of there. And same exact thing on the other side of the socket. And I'll finish up the uh, cleanup of uh, this socket, and I guess all of them on this board. Now before we test fit, there's a few checks that we can make. We want to make sure this back wall is either perfectly square or there is a little bit of a gap along the bottom. That's going to make sure that the dovetail seats fully along the top. So I have a combination square here, just long enough to hit the, uh, the back of the socket there. And I can just run it through here and make sure that the top of the square is contacting all the way down. If there's some junk in here, it's going to push the square away from that top and you'll see a gap there. And that's the same thing you'll see if you have the, uh, the dovetail in there. You'll end up with a gap along the top. The other thing you can do with the square as you're going through this check is along the bottom. Same exact thing. You want the square to touch out here and be a little bit gappy towards the bottom. Ideally it's undercut so nothing gets in the way of that tail coming all the way in. So I want to see a small gap along the back as I'm coming back along here and checking all of my sockets. The other thing you want to check is going to be the squareness of all the pins. Those are the glue surfaces. Those are the only ones that actually matter. So you want to just make sure they're nice and square, which they should be if you follow the scribe line that was scribed you know, square to the end anyway. But it's a nice little check before you go smacking things together and you won't have any, well, you have fewer surprises in theory. This looks good. So let's try a test fit. Not too bad, a few gaps here and there. Doesn't really matter again because it's all gonna be hidden, but it's a nice warm up for you know the ones that actually matter. See I got a nice little gap right there. But other than that, there's a few small ones here and there. No big deals. Alright, let me do the other one and we'll get that one thrown on here. So now we have our box all dovetailed together. Thanks because we're working on getting the dividers installed, which will further tie the case together and support all of the drawers, which will be in here. The way I like to do this is with a, I guess a scrap piece of wood or a scrap piece of sheet goods. That's gonna be my little reference guide, as well as a router with a dovetail bit and a guide bushing on it. 
the piece of sheet goods is going to make it that these things can only be cut in one place and you don't have to worry about any kind of layout errors or anything like that because the biggest thing with these dividers is that you want them all to be coplanar in the same plane. If you have one divider that's like a little bit off in one way or another, it's going to cause the actual web frame which supports the drawer to have a twist in it and it's going to cause the drawer to rock inside the opening. So I don't even bother <laughs> with any kind of layout. I just have my little piece of sheet goods which I just trim down to the appropriate size to get my divider where it needs to be. The biggest thing again is that these don't need to be exactly in a correct position. They all need to be just in that same position. So if my drawer opening ends up being a sixteenth of an inch bigger or less than what I was expecting, that's not a big deal. If one divider ends up being a sixteenth, you know, high or low, that's going to be a bigger deal for the web frame. So the process for this is very simple. I have my piece of sheet goods set up so that it is going to put the top divider in the right spot. I'm doing this all based off of the center line of the divider and then my guide bushing in my router is a one inch diameter so my piece of sheet goods is a half inch narrower than where I want my divider to end up. So all I have to do is just clamp my piece of sheet goods to the case. I'll probably put a clamp on the case just to make sure the bottom which is essentially the reference for this is fully seated in those dovetails and doesn't go anywhere. I'll cut the front sliding dovetail socket thing. I'll move on to cut the back one. I'll flip the case 180 degrees, move my sheet good to the other side, repeat that process for the two on that side, and then I can trim my piece of sheet goods down to size for the next one, and so forth and so on until all of these dividers are fully cut. Every position has four sockets, and then there's three actual dovetailed dividers, so 12 of these total sockets. It should go fairly quickly. As far as the depth goes, I have my dovetail bit set to cut to a depth about about uh, 9 sixteenths or so, right around there. Again, the actual depth isn't a huge deal as long as everything is absolutely consistent. So I have that depth set, I have the, the router like locked in so it does not move through all, all these cuts. And the depth of the dovetail is more of an aesthetic thing. I again like a very small or fine uh, wall on the uh, outside of the dovetails. The same thing with my half lines. I typically go for about an eighth of an inch or so. So that's about what this is set for. Maybe a little bit less than that this time. And then the last thing, when I'm done cutting all 12 sockets before I move on or touch the router or do anything, is I'm going to do a quick little sample setup and make myself a setup block that's going to make the next step cutting all of the actual tails a lot easier. It's going to give me a quick way to set the router bit height on the router table and give me a uh, handheld sample piece to test fit against versus having to try and test it against the case. All right, so that takes care of our 12 uh, sliding dovetail socket things. And one thing to note, as you probably notice, is that on one side of the socket as the bit's coming in, you're gonna get some tear out as the bit's coming through and pulling the fibers out. You can do two things here. If this is gonna be your finished surface, you can back that up with another piece of material so that uh, you can just remove that piece of material later. Or in my case with this piece, this is not a finished surface, the front of this whole case is going to be further processed for that front facade. So any of this tear out or chip out here is not going to be a problem because it's still waste. In the back, we haven't cut the rabbit yet either, so that's all going to be removed too. So there's no reason for me to worry about tear out uh, at this point. So next we can get working on the dividers and getting that stock milled up for it. So I have my divider stock here. It's still rough milled, still oversized. And I'll make one quick note on that. The dovetail bit is three quarters of an inch wide at the very tip here. So if we make the divider stock three quarters, you essentially have to create the angle of the dovetail right at the very edge of the stock. So I make that a little bit easier and make it uh, less prone to have like a flat area on there by accident. I'm gonna go ahead and make the divider stock a little bit thicker. So in my case, let's say, let's say 13 sixteenths or something like that. Just a little bit proud of the width of the bit. Let's make it a little bit easier when we cut those sliding dovetails. So real quick, I'm just going to run through and get everything uh, milled down to final thickness, rip to final width, and then we can take a look at getting them all cut down to final length.
So next it's time to cut the actual dovetails onto the ends of all the dividers. So I have the router table set up to do that. I used my little test setup thing here to get my bit height into roughly the right space, or right space, the right height. And then I have created a little bit of a zero clearance type of situation here with a tall fence and a uh, base piece on the bottom. That's going to give me a nice smooth surface so there's nowhere for anything to hang up as the pieces are coming across the bit. So the nice thing about having this little sample piece here is that this is obviously a lot easier to deal with than the whole case so we can run some tests and see how things go. So the best thing for testing is going to be the offcuts from the divider stock because it's all the same thickness. So my first two tests were just to get the bit height set correctly. So if I put this in here, I had a little bit of a gap down there on the shoulder. So I needed to lower the bit a little bit. I did that uh, twice and then I started sneaking up on the actual fit for the thickness of the tail. Now the most challenging part about this is that this is a very high tolerance type of situation. There really isn't a whole lot of room for error. You can go too far too quickly and this will not fit correctly. So the way I end up doing this is I end up kind of erring on the side of a little too tight. That way I don't have to worry about it being too loose. If it's too loose, you can see what happens. If it's too loose, this is an exaggeration obviously, then you have a gap here and here and you really need this to be like super, super snug. So the fit that I went for was something like this. Like this is pretty darn tight, but if it needs to be adjusted, it's a lot easier to really quickly adjust this fit than it is to, you know, try and add more material back on. So this is uh, definitely snug right now, but that's not a huge, huge deal to me. Now before actually going through and cutting the real dividers, I'm also gonna just test it on the case and see how it does over here. Again, this is a little bit snug, but it is like really nice. So a really easy thing to do at this point would be to cut them all like this so they're a little bit tight and then really just like, just give a little sanding with some sandpaper and be surprised, just a quick sanding and they, snug, they slide them perfectly without any kind of issue. So let's uh, go ahead and cut all these dividers, I guess. Now a big thing with the actual feed for this is going to be uh, consistency. I guess more than anything. So you need to have nice consistent pressure into the fence and nice consistent pressure down to the table. If you do any kind of uh, walking on it, if the workpiece tips at all or kind of moves around too much, it will have an issue with the overall fit. One thing I like to do is run the piece over twice just in case my pressure was a little bit different or what have you. It's, it's incredible how much of a difference a little bit of change in pressure can make. And in some cases, like again, this is not gonna be a huge deal on this piece, but you're gonna wanna have some kind of support piece on the back side of the divider that can help to stabilize the tall work piece, which is kind of awkward, but it also will prevent the bit from blowing out that work piece. Again, not a big deal for this project because the front edge of all these dividers are gonna get profiled. So it makes no difference if there's any kind of tear out or blowout back there. So this side is fitting really nicely. On this side, still just a little bit on the tight side. I can't quite slide that in. So I can either adjust the tail itself with a little sandpaper, or I can go back to the router table and just put a little more pressure as I'm feeding this thing through, and that should make it fit a little bit looser, or it should loosen the fit just a little bit. Or you can do both. So I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna run over to the router table real quick give it a quick pass, and then we'll see how it fits afterwards. Now with the joinery finish on all the dividers front and back, I think uh, I'll be working towards doing the serpentine profile next. So the only little last thing I have to do is to cut and fit the false bottom divider. That's gonna be pretty easy. That's just a simple cross cut on one end, come back to the case, make a mark, and cut it down to final length. And that one just slip in between the case sides, and that'll take care of everything we're gonna need before heading into the serpentine pattern facade thing on the front of that case. So that's going to be the fundamental construction method of any case piece. 
that is going to be constructed out of solid wood and dovetail together, no matter what the kind of style or ornamentation is. So if you like these more in-depth videos, definitely check out my classes over in the guild. This time, I'm going to recommend you take a look at the High Boy. Uh, I've said this many times about that project, but the High Boy is simply a chest of drawers sitting on top of a table. The two pieces are constructed in exactly the same ways you would construct those two individual pieces. We have a table with some drawers, and then up top is just a chest of drawers, and that is built exactly the same way as this serpentine chest. The only difference is the ornamentation and the stylistic choices. If you have a dovetailed chest of drawers, a flat front, a curvy front, some kind of crazy bonnet top, it's all fundamentally the same, just kind of trimmed out and uh, detailed a little bit differently. And again, if you want to take on the challenge of making your own serpentine chest of drawers, I do have a full set of plans over on my website that you can check out as well. So that is going to do it for this one. Next time we're going to take our basic dovetailed case and uh, make it all curvy and introduce the serpentine profile into the case, which would be uh, fun, maybe? We'll see. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this one. Thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the serpentine chest of drawers or anything here in the shop, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking.